Hey, Michigan fans, Keith here from Lewis Jewelers, and we are super excited to be able to cheer on all the student athletes that will be on the field and the courts this season. But just like Michigan sports, special moments have not been canceled. Come into Lewis Jewelers or visit lewisjewelers.com so our team can help you celebrate birthdays, anniversaries, or your just because moments. Go blue! Welcome to the Wolverine.com podcast, the Maze and Blue Breakdown. I am Clayton Safey with Austin Fox here. Both of us from the Wolverine.com. Head over to the Wolverine.com right now. Get 60 days of our premium content for free using the promo code BLUE60. Plug that in. You get two months absolutely free. All the premium content, insider stuff. And right now is a perfect time, despite no games the last couple of weeks. Uh, info is flowing in. I had a signing day, all the recruiting updates, updates on at Michigan football going forward, including Jim Harbaugh's future. Some couple topics we'll talk about here at the beginning before we get to Michigan basketball, which is the much more fun topic these days. Uh, and we will get some uh, Big Ten basketball power rankings. Uh, we'll pick a couple college football games at the end. Um and we'll basically, uh, we're going to predict Michigan's Big Ten record now that they're out of non-conference play here for hoops. So uh, all that is to come. Uh, but Austin, obviously the biggest storyline of this week surrounding Michigan athletics is the Kansas-Michigan-Ohio State game on Tuesday afternoon. Uh, it was trending this way for a long time. Michigan reportedly has over 45 scholarship players that are out to positive tests or contact tracing. They wanted to do everything they could to, uh, you know, to play this game, but that's the reality of this thing. We've seen games all across the country canceled. Um, Michigan is now, you know, joins a slew of other teams in the Big Ten that have had to cancel a game and then cancel the next week. Every team that's canceled the game in the Big Ten has had to do so the next week, other than Ohio State uh, canceling a couple weeks ago, choosing to cancel, and then uh, playing Michigan State last week. So that that's basically the outlier. This was trending this way um and it's kind of the depressing reality of 2020 no michigan ohio state for the first time since 1917 um and the crazy thing is we have absolutely no idea what would have happened in this game had it been played yeah the writing was on the wall for this one leading up to it i think everybody who tom saw our updates prior to tuesday's cancellation and realized that this was probably going to happen you had Clowns like Pete Tamil of Yahoo Sports in the media tweeting out beforehand that, you know, there's opti optimism in Ann Arbor and that this game might actually get played on Monday. Uh, he tweeted that on Monday, and then, of course, the day later it gets canceled. So Chris Ballas has been on top of this thing the entire time. He's had reliable updates all along and had been reporting that this game was probably going to be canceled. So it didn't come as any surprise whatsoever. And like you said, it's the first time since 1917. These two won't be playing. That's hard to believe. They've played every year since then, including the World War II years. So Jim Harbaugh, we had heard, wanted to play this game. He told the team he was fired up to play it before it was canceled. The players wanted to play. We saw their reactions on Twitter, and they were crushed, man. You're, they're going to have to wait another full year to face Ohio State. And, yeah, it's a shame that it came to this. But, again, it's no surprise. And uh, – in a normal year, I would be incredibly disappointed, but uh, seeing as how poorly coached this Michigan team has been this year, I'll be honest, this cancellation doesn't break my heart one bit. Yeah, and the players have, have done a horrible job as well uh, throughout the season, but despite all that, um, it, it crushes me as a, as a college football fan, you know, as somebody who has followed this rivalry and, and enjoyed this rivalry each and every year. Uh, I will not let 2020 trick me into just thinking that things should be canceled if, you know, if they don't go your way. So uh, I am holding out for, um, you know, the, you know, basically I feel like our minds have been tricked this year into thinking like, oh, I, w I hope this gets can canceled or whatever. Like you would never think like that in another year. No, I don't blame anyone because that's just the way the year has gone. But it's just what a surreal year and no NCAA tournament, no Michigan, Ohio State. Um and, you know, we went the stretch with, you know, covering college football and basketball without anything to cover. Um, and here we are towards the end of the season, possibly uh, a game next week on Champions Week. Obviously, those updates are going to come. And, and I think the uh, the latest report is that those matchups are going to be released on Monday. Uh, so we won't really know who Michigan is set to play on Monday. And then we'll actually see if they 
are cleared to come back to practice. This team wasn't going to be cleared to come back to practice by the end of the week this week. Uh, so there was just no way they were going to be able to do it. And that was the medical team uh, that we heard from the other day on a press conference that they weren't going to be able to clear this team. The positive tests continue to go up. Uh, it makes this next game in doubt. Uh, Michigan would have one of the bigger outbreaks in the country if they missed three straight games. But considering they were down 45 scholarship players as of a couple days ago, they might have one of the bigger outbreaks in the country, which is just crazy because they've done such a great job throughout the season. But at the same time, you, sometimes this virus, you just can't do anything about it. Yeah, if Michigan would have taken the field on Saturday at Ohio State and if that game would have been played, this Michigan roster would have been a shell of its former self. And that's an extremely scary thought when considering how uh, how poor they were at full strength. So Ballas had reported that that Michigan's quarterback situation likely would have been freshman Dan Valari and a lot of Wildcat with Hassan Haskins. So that's a pretty scary thought as well. Uh, they were down full position groups. Guys, it sounds like we're dropping like flies. And it was a pretty sad press conference on Wednesday with Ward Manuel and Jim Harbaugh and some of the team physicians. They were pretty sad, and it was obvious that they wanted this game to be played. So I don't know what's next for this team moving forward. I don't know what's going to happen on December 19th with that, that extra game that's supposed to be played. I think it's more likely than not that Michigan does not play a game that day, but I also think it's a possibility that some of these tests get cleared up and that we could see Michigan take the field one last time. As for the opponent, who knows? I know they wanted to uh, match up even records from the East and the West, but I don't know how likely that is at this point. What if a team has to cancel that week? And then that obviously throws the standings off in a big way. We know Ohio State and Northwestern will be in the Big Ten Championship that day at noon. But as for the other matchups around the league that could happen that day, I really have no clue who will be playing each other and who Michigan's potential opponents could be. Yeah. And like you saw Indiana Purdue get canceled as well. I, I think Joe Milton would have given it a go this week. He's been battling a, a hand injury for uh, a few weeks here. And obviously Cade McNamara, uh, that is a brutal injury. He was able to come back, but I think once that thing stiffens up, uh, you know, he, I don't even know, you know, obviously the specifics, but uh, it, it looked bad enough with that arm dangling on the sideline that it, it could require surgery. So obviously uh, we'll see if we ever get any updates on that, but uh, he was looking pretty sharp there even early in that Penn state game. And then obviously going back to Rutgers. So yeah, we would see what this team would look like next week. Um, and, you know, I think you could get a, a significant portion of your team back if you can actually get the positive tests to, to stop coming in, you know, where you get the contract tracing uh, down. Obviously, the, the guys who tested positive would still be out with the 21-day rule, which, by the way, Ryan Day said that the Big Ten is thinking about changing. So, of course, towards the end of the season, they changed the rule for Ohio State to get into the Big Ten championship game after having it the entire year, which I thought was um, dumb that they changed it. I mean, you have this rule, and then as soon as it's about to go into effect and you're going to actually use the rule, you switch it, Oh, and by the way, we might switch the 21-day thing that has never made sense. Uh, 11 days longer than what the CDC is recommending. So the Big Ten's got it in. They're, they're trying to get their team in. They're trying to get their $6 million uh, bonus that they would get for a team getting in the college football playoff. But uh, I thought Ohio State was going to get in either way, whether they played a Wisconsin team next week in the two-versus-two two matchup or not. I, I think they're one of the best four teams in the country, and the committee's got them in the top four as it is. But um, Big Ten just trying to do everything they can there. Um, but you mentioned that press conference. That kind of gets us into the next topic here with Jim Harbaugh, his future as Michigan's head coach. Uh, obviously, one year left on his deal. You can't go into the last year as a lame duck um, head coach, you know, without a extension. And, you know, it basically show that he's going to be out of there after the year. And, you know, so you got to sign an extension here. And it's confusing why they don't get something done before signing day. I could see waiting till after the regular season in a normal year to talk about things. And Ward Manuel says they talk every year in November after the regular season. But uh, signing day this year is mid season because they pushed the schedule back. So you got to get something done. Uh, they said that they're not going to until after the year. I think that's probably the most likely scenario that they. Uh, you know, he either signs the extension or, or they don't, and the writing would be on the wall for what's going to happen next. But 
Um, I wouldn't be shocked, you know, if it's the end of this week or, or early next week before signing day that they get something done. Maybe they're negotiating. Maybe they're working out details. You know, maybe Jim Harbaugh's mulling over what he wants to do. I think those are really the options here. Um, but, man, well, what a year. I mean, I, I think it's a bad look right now that they haven't got anything done. I don't think it's as bad as people are making it out to be. Some people are criticizing Michigan and Ward Manuel and Jim Harbaugh like crazy for this whole contract situation, saying it's a clown show and that both parties have no idea what they're doing on this. But anybody who's not in on those meetings and knows what's going on behind closed doors, I don't think can say that. We don't know what's being said. Between the two parties, I'll be honest, I don't think Jim Harbaugh knows what he wants to do at this point. I think that he wants to return to Michigan but realizes the the mess that the team is in right now and I think that that the NFL possibilities are intriguing to him as well I don't think there's any question that some NFL teams will come after him but regardless I think we'll have a final decision here within the next week or two because yeah you're absolutely right this thing does need to get wrapped up sooner rather than later recruits are kind of in limbo right now if it does get wrapped up after the uh, I believe it's December 16th signing day so either way I think it'll be right around that time but Again, for people criticizing the situation as much as they are, I don't think that's accurate when considering we don't know what's all being said behind closed doors. Maybe Ward Manuel is handling this thing a lot better than people realize. But either way, uh, nothing would surprise me at this point. <laughs> We've heard reports that that originally a long or a three-year contract extension was on the table for Harbaugh and that he was going to take it. And now those have kind of flipped in recent weeks and that we've heard the longer this thing goes, the more likely... Harbaugh is to leave, so I think it's 50-50 right now as to whether or not Jim Harbaugh is Michigan's coach next season. Yeah, and I, it's just you know obvious thinking, I guess, that as the days go on. I mean, if you're going to get it done, you might as well get it done now. Um, but who knows what's going on? And, and I guess I would I criticize Ward Manuel for what's going on um, unless he has given Jim Harbaugh a contract offer that's that's fair and you know, that he should want to take, uh, and Jim has just not taken it, you know, and then Ward's not going to, you're not going to fire him on the spot before the end of the season. I, I guess that would be the only logical way of handling it. At the same time, Jim Harbaugh's a, a stubborn guy, a, a so, very uh, laser-focused guy. I don't think he even talked to Jim Hackett directly um, back in 2014 in December uh, until a day or two before his last game, and then I guess agreed uh, kind of in principle to become Michigan's next head coach, knowing he wasn't going to be there. So it was kind of other people doing the communication for him at that point while he was completely focused on San Francisco and trying to uh, make the playoffs. But basically, um, you know, it could be that situation. At the same time, it's not the same. I, I don't understand it. But you mentioned we don't know what's going on behind the closed doors. I mean, this is Jim Harbaugh's notorious for being – very tight-lipped on anything, and he doesn't have people that speak anonymously for him like some other coaches have. He doesn't have an agent uh, like just about every other coach in the country has. So here we are. We're, there's a lot of unknown, uh, and obviously we will know a lot more in one week. Uh, we will not. Lo we will know just about everything probably in two weeks because uh, that's just the natural timeline here with the end of the season. And um, you know, it could be in the next day or two. It could be in the next five days that something comes out where they say, "Hey, we we did have some time to, uh, you know, sit down and talk about it." And you know, this is the resolution. We'll sign a three-year deal. We'll see what happens. Um, uh, you mentioned the NFL team. He's definitely going to get looks, and and probably already has got some feelers from NFL teams. And I would say my Detroit Lions, if if he does want to leave, and you know, I would say Michigan's got to do what they can to to keep this guy. But he's a great coach. If if I'm I'm a Detroit Lions fan, I would love to have him in Detroit if, uh, you know, if, if it doesn't work out at Michigan. But I, I think that, you know, Michigan's got to do what they can um, to keep him here. But it's going to be it's going to be interesting, man. I, I'm about 50 52. I, I'd say I'm I'm closer to the 51 percent that he's going to stay at Michigan. Um, but it's it's gotten closer to 50 50 in the last couple of days, really. Yeah, if I had to make a prediction one way or one way or the other, I think that <clears throat> excuse me, I think he'll stay as well. But one quick thing on the the Harbaugh situation with the 49ers when he wouldn't talk to Jim Hackett until that uh, that season was over. Harbaugh's made it clear in the past that when he has a job, his entire focus is solely on that job, and he wants to get the job uh, completed 
until he moves his focus onto another. So I just want to say that I respect the heck out of that. And I wish a lot of other people around the country, whether it's in sports or business or whatever, would take that same approach that Harbaugh takes. At the same time, if this is the job, you could argue, you know, your sole focus is on this job. If, you know, your sole focus on this job going forward as well, then part of that sole focus would be getting it done because recruiting is the lifeblood of, of college football. Um, but again, he's he's never operated really the way that other coaches have, so it's just hard to say, right? I mean... Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. This situation is definitely different than the one he had in San Fran because that involved changing jobs, but Ward Manuel made it clear that him and Jim Harbaugh are going to talk here at the end of the season, and it's not necessarily to, you know, it's not groundbreaking news. They talk every year at the end of the season, so Ward Manuel made it clear that that isn't huge news that they're going to reevaluate things because, again, they do that at the end of every season and at the end of every season that Jim Harbaugh has been here. So it's not like Ward Manuel is going to take that time to then make a decision. I think he's been uh, uh, planning this situation better than a lot of people want to give him credit for, and I think he has a plan in place regardless of whether or not Jim Harbaugh stays or leaves at this point. Yeah, it'd be crazy to think. In, in 2016, when he took the job, that he had John Beeline and, and Jim Harbaugh, and it could be just a few years later that neither of them are here. So it is a huge storyline going forward, especially with Michigan not on the field. And we hope uh, that they can play next week in Champions Week and, and you know, whoever that would be, whether that's Purdue, Nebraska, um, you know, whatever. I'd love to see it. Um, at the same time, we got some basketball that is, like I mentioned at the top, kind of lighter news because uh this basketball team has been pretty fun to watch outside of a, a scare against Oakland in a game that uh, you know they didn't really take too seriously based on the energy of that team in that game and then you're playing a team that runs a really aggressive zone and whatever I know Oakland's horrible horrible but watching five games so far the other four have been pretty pretty damn good uh I, I kind of see it as an outlier at this point and um you know at, at the same time they haven't played really anybody they've played a few decent mac teams but uh it's gonna get a lot harder um penn state on sunday but uh you can't complain five and oh coming out of the schedule you had you obviously had the nc state game which i was looking forward to canceled um or postponed and you know now you have toledo last night uh, a really good win toledo's the the top ranked team on ken palm in the mac uh so you know no cupcake opponent uh in a 20 point win um, most impressive thing for you uh, in the in the first five games from Michigan. How do you pick just one at this point? This team has yeah. exceeded my expectations so far. I thought they would be a pretty darn good team by the time the end of the year came around, but they're ahead of schedule so far, in my opinion. If I had to pick one thing that's impressed me most, uh, I think it's going to be the answer a lot of people would give. Freshman center Hunter Dickinson. He's averaging 14 points and seven boards per game this year. He's clearly the best center on the roster, even though he's not starting right now, but maybe uh, coming up here, seeing as how we don't know how serious Austin Davis's injury is, but he's way ahead of schedule as well. I thought there would be growing pains with him early on, and that just hasn't been the case. Perhaps one of the reasons he's been so good is because he trained with Luca Garza last offseason in the Washington, D.C. area, and we heard reports from sources close to the situation that said Dickinson was beating Garza in some of these one-on-one -on -one matchups. So he looks like a polished uh, player already. A Big Ten play is going to be obviously be a big step up in competition, but I think he's going to hold his own against a lot of these Big Ten centers. This Sunday test against Penn State, man, at Chrysler Center is going to be a pretty darn good test for this Michigan team because they destroyed Virginia Tech in Blacksburg the other night. I know Virginia Tech isn't exactly an elite team, but I believe they were ranked in the top 20. So, again, this Penn State team is going to be a tough test. I do think UCF last Sunday was also a good test for this Michigan team, and they passed with flying colors. Johnny Dawkins has had some pretty good UCF teams in recent years, and while this uh, Knights team obviously wasn't great, I think they were at least decent. So Michigan has really handled their business very impressively in every game. Outside of that Oakland game, like you said, there's no question. They thought they were going to roll over that team and didn't have the appropriate focus and it showed, but at this time of the year, it's all about uh, winning and advancing. That's basically all it comes down to, kind of like the March 
uh, motto, survive in advance. So this team's 5-0. and They're in good shape. And looking at the upcoming schedule, I like them to keep uh, continuing their winning ways. They should beat Penn State on Sunday. A Christmas test with Nebraska should be a Michigan win. And then you face a bad Maryland team on New Year's Eve. So it's exciting to think about where this team can go and what they have coming up. And I expect them to contend for a Big Ten title this year, even though the top of the Big Ten is absolutely loaded with the likes of Illinois, Iowa, Michigan State, and Wisconsin. In Ohio State, I'd throw in that mix. And even Rutgers uh, near you know Michigan's level, it's going to be a gauntlet. Um, but you mentioned some of the games they have coming up, some games they should win. They have to, because if you want to contend for the Big Ten, like – like you said that, you know, you think they will. I think they can, but the last eight games of the year is such a gauntlet within a gauntlet of a Big Ten schedule that they have to win some of the games here coming up that they can. Here's the last eight games. Michigan State, Illinois, at Wisconsin, Rutgers, at Ohio State, at Indiana, Iowa, at Michigan State. So that February-March stretch is going to be very hard. And you have to win a lot of those games if you're going to win the Big Ten, uh, at least get a tie of the Big Ten or finish in that top four and get that double bye in the Big Ten tournament. But going back to the most impressive, or I'll, I'll say this, great tweet um, that I found last night about Hunter Dickinson. You mentioned how he's he's just clearly the best big on this team uh, and not starting. But and, and give credit to Austin Davis for scoring the first 10 points of the game last night. Um LG Hale, who's a good Twitter uh, Twitter follow, says, uh, this is in quotations, coming off the bench tonight following his 40-point quadruple double is Hunter Dickinson. Like, it, it's just going to, what is it going to be like? I mean, I don't know how long he'll be here, but two years later, it's like, all right, he dropped 50 last night. Here he is off the bench. Uh, I don't know if he'll ever start. <laughs> <laughs> At this rate, right? I think a Davis injury is what it's going to take to get Dickinson in the starting lineup. But, man, five games into his college career, and he's already averaging these these impressive stats. Like I said, 14 points and seven boards. Juwan Howard obviously knows how to coach big men, seeing as how successful he was as a big man himself at Michigan and in the NBA. So we had heard prior to Dickinson's arrival that he was likely not going to be a one and done. This was going to be a guy who stayed in college at least two years. But we had also heard that that he was a bit of a project and that it would take some time. And that's not the case. So. Yeah, at this point, I'm just basically hoping that he is in Ann Arbor next year, but perhaps we should pump the brakes a little bit and see how he does in Big Ten play. If he continues to succeed at a high level in Big Ten play, then <clears throat> excuse me, him leaving after the year I think is a real possibility when considering he's already seven foot one and has the body to succeed in the NBA. Yeah, I mean, Iggy Brezdakis wasn't a one and done until he was either. Yeah, he's going to have a decision to make after the season, it looks like right now. Uh, can't wait to see him against some Big Ten bigs um, because they have played teams that they can just kind of overpower with his height and he can kind of bully down there. Um, and Penn State doesn't have any any large uh, big men or anything like that. So we're going to have to continue to wait here until we see him. But at least there are Big Ten caliber players that he'll be going up against starting uh, Sunday against Penn State. And uh, that'll be interesting. But my, my most impressive thing out of this team is just the offense in general, looking at a, a little bit of a bigger picture. This is the sixth best offense in the country, uh, efficiency wise, according to Ken Palm. And you watch just how smooth it is. Last year, they had a lot of scoring droughts. They would, you know, go through sometimes. And that was with Xavier Simpson at the point guard spot. And John Teske, a guy who knows, you know, how to run the pick and roll in, in the ball screen as good as anybody, which Xavier Simpson and, and Jawan Howard loved to run last year. Uh, they're still doing a lot of it. But, um, and this is, this is with Michigan not even shooting that well from deep. Uh, they shot well last night at 56%, but they were coming into that game shooting under 33%. From three, and the offense is super efficient uh, against Toledo, uh, scoring over 1.4 points per possession, which is just ridiculous. And they were just humming um, really all night long. The, the one concern I do have is some of the defensive things here. Um, the rotations seem a little slow at times. They kind of collapse too easily and lose a guy on the outside. Toledo missed some open looks early. But the, the thing I will say about this Michigan team, and I've noticed this really over the last couple of years with Jawan Howard, is that they start slow defensively all too often. That's a knock on them. But 
they always seem to kind of adjust. He gets into these guys during timeouts. There's been half times or I don't know how many games over the last couple of years that we've, you know, been in these post game press conferences and it'll be, uh, you know, such a different story first half to second half. And he gets asked what the message was at half. And, you know, Juwan Howard will kind of laugh and say, well, you know, it wasn't the nicest halftime speech. And, you know, so I'll give him credit. I'll give Saudi Washington, the lead defensive assistant credit for, you know, what they have done, making adjustments throughout the games on defense. And I think the defense will get better. I think it's a bit of a concern um, going forward once you start playing some tougher competition because, frankly, we saw some teams come into Chrysler last year. Penn State's one of them where they just have a couple guys that get hot and Michigan, um, you know, doesn't have a huge answer for it. Uh, I will say the the most impressive part of the defense has been Eli Brooks in, in the way he has continued what he did last year on that end of the floor. Um, last night holding uh, Marion Jackson, the you know top Toledo guard, a really good player, a guy that could play in the Big Ten to 4 of 16 from the field, and he didn't even score in the first half. So uh, Eli Brooks continues to impress on, on the defensive side. If he can start hitting some of those, uh, some more of those open threes, then he's going to be just even more valuable than he already is. But he's such a big piece and probably the unsung hero of this team. And that lineup with him at point guard and Shawnee Brown at shooting guard uh, going with a little bit of a bigger look and taking Mike Smith out of the game has been incredibly effective. So I, I like that Michigan has some lineup versatility. There's a lot to like. Um, you know, we, we just don't know, I guess, how effective that's going to be against better teams. But at the same time, you know, that we've seen it work against other teams and, and we'll just have to keep looking at it going forward. Right, exactly. I love the the lineups and the rotations that they've had so far this year and how deep this team is when you have an option to bring off the bench like Shondi Brown that's a huge weapon he's shooting 46 percent from three on the year and Isaiah Livers is knocking down 48 percent of his threes so and like you said Michigan really hadn't been clicking from three yet this year prior to last night when they hit 56 percent of their shots from deep so once this team gets hot from deep and I think there's a real possibility that they do eventually they're going to be scary good on offense, one of the knocks, I guess, that I would give this team so far is the defense. Like you talked about, they were getting torn up by big men early last year when Garza put up 44 on a Matt Chrysler in December, and Kofi Coburn had a big game against them for Illinois. So it seemed like opposing centers were consistently putting up huge numbers on Michigan, but then they slowly did adjust, and they got better on that end. And that's one of the signs of a good coach is that you do make adjustments Jawan Howard figured out a lot of these teams' tendencies the second time around when Michigan played a lot of these Big Ten teams, Michigan State being a good example of that. They gave up, I believe, 87 points in early January in Lansing the first time the two teams played last year, and then Michigan beat them the second time around at Chrysler Center. So, again, Jawan Howard is only in his second year as a head coach, and he's still making a lot of adjustments on the fly, and that's where a guy like assistant coach Phil Martelli who's been a head coach for 30-plus years of college basketball, is absolutely valuable. And I'll be honest, I am really excited about what I'm seeing from this team and what they can be not only this year, but moving forward throughout the rest of Juwan Howard's tenure when considering how well he's recruiting. You mentioned the the Michigan State game. Uh, Isaiah Livers helped a little bit, too, in between those two games. And I remember uh, Chris Ballas asking Tom Izzo, after the game, you know, just the difference between facing a Michigan team without Isaiah Livers the first time and then with him in that second time when Michigan really handled Michigan State at Chrysler and Izzo, the look on his face. I mean, he was disgusted walking in that room. It was a it was a fun press conference for us. Uh, uh, <laughs> and he he goes, well, if we would have had Josh Langford, you know, whatever. Weird, weird response. But I will never forget that and, uh, and uh, you know, Chris asking the first question, leading off the presser as he likes to do. Uh, you remember that? Oh, I remember it perfectly. You and I were sitting by each other giggling after a big Michigan win. Uh, I don't giggle. Hey, hey, I wasn't giggling. I don't giggle. Sorry, we were giddy. Maybe that's a better word for it. Ballas was having a field day with it. And yeah, it was an all around exciting afternoon. And seeing the look on Izzo's face when he walked in and how disappointed he was made it even better. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you can kind of tell he's. He doesn't really like Jawan Howard very much, and it's going to be a fun, it's going to be a fun rivalry. They're going to have some big games here uh, in February and March. Senior Day at uh, Breslin Center in March. I don't know if they'll be able to kiss the floor. COVID, you know, we'll see what happens uh, with that. But uh, it, it's going to be fun here in this Big Ten schedule. I am, I am amped up and uh, and ready to go here. Uh, let's predict our Big Ten records. Um, 
let's uh it's tough and i went through the schedule and kind of looked at it you can't pick game by game at this point because we're talking about months away but there's that gauntlet of the stretch of a stretch uh in the last eight games a little bit easier so michigan kind of eases themselves into big 10 play but uh, we did this last year, and we would do kind of periodic updates of how we think Michigan's going to finish in the Big Ten. And I kind of like that because it kind of gauges where we're at on this team. Uh, the Big Ten's so tough. So I'm saying 11 and 9, but that's an impressive thing, I think, at this point, just because of how hard it is. And like I mentioned, Michigan has a tough schedule, especially in the second half of that Big Ten slate. So um, that would kind of put Michigan, I think, right on the outside of a double bye in the Big Ten tournament. Uh, I hate that I just said tournament. I always say tournament, but uh, at the same time, you win one or two of those games that maybe I have them losing, and you're right in the mix there for a Big Ten title. So I think that's kind of the line right now for me is 11 wins, uh, which is still impressive in my mind. Can I give two answers for this yeah. uh, for this question? I'm going to agree with you on the 11 and nine part, but I'm going to also say 12 and eight being a real possibility. I think the Big Ten champion this year might realistically have seven losses at 13 and seven, probably 14 and six at best. So you're spot on when you say that that 11 and nine is not a disaster or anything like that. And it might actually be impressive for some teams. The Big Ten is absolutely loaded this year. One through 14, it's the deepest in recent memory, perhaps since that 2013 season. And it's going to be a dogfight every night in this conference throughout the season. Illinois and Iowa, I know, are two teams that a lot of people are excited about and look really good so far, but guess what? They're going to go through growing pains, and they're going to lose games as well, and they'll probably finish with six losses in league play. So if Michigan were to finish 12-8, and eight, like I think there's a real possibility they do, that might be good enough to finish only one game off the conference title. So that just goes to show you how deep the league is this year and how brutal of a grind this conference schedule is going to be. Definitely. It's been fun to watch some of these teams, too, and just kind of look forward to uh, seeing them here in Big Ten play. Uh, let's do our Big Ten power rankings, the first edition. We'll do this periodically as well throughout the year like we did a year ago. Um, best teams in the Big Ten. I'll let you kick this one off. Go Give me uh, 1 to 14 here. Um, and it's, it's been tough to judge because everyone's played a, it's been, you know, varied, I guess, how challenging each team's schedule has been, but Hey, we'll give it a shot. I like it. Is it cool if I start at the bottom and work my way up? Sure. You can start with Nebraska. Okay. <laughs> hey, you actually guessed it right. I did put Nebraska at 14. I thought about <clears throat> Northwestern in this spot as well, but I got to go with Nebraska because I do have Northwestern. At 13, they've actually exceeded my expectations so far. They lost a heartbreaker last night to Pittsburgh by one point in the Big Ten ACC Challenge. But Northwestern, I think... That was so frustrating to watch. Oh, my gosh. They led that entire game. I actually didn't see the last play or two where Pitt won it. But, yeah, I think Northwestern blew that one. Boo-Bouye. Boo-Bouye was awful down the stretch. No offense to him if he's listening. The sophomore guard. Yeah. So I have them as the second worst team in the conference. I have Minnesota at 12th. I've not been impressed with them so far. They did beat Boston College in overtime in the in the Big Ten ACC Challenge, but I still think they're one of the worst teams in the conference. Maryland checks in at number 11. This is a bad Maryland team, in my opinion. They were annihilated last night at Clemson. I believe they were down like 33-15 to 15 or something at halftime. The loss of Anthony Cowan. And uh, Jalen Smith from last year's team, it looks like it's just too much to overcome. So this is not a good Maryland team. Purdue at number 10. This is one of Matt Painter's lesser teams in recent years. They do have seven foot four freshman center, Zach Eady, who's been a boost so far this year. But they're still one of the worst teams in the conference, in my opinion. Clemson also beat them during Thanksgiving weekend. I have Penn State at number nine. And they might be a team on the rise after what they did at Virginia Tech. The other night in the Big Ten ACC Challenge, this actually looks like a pretty good Penn State team. And the fact they're at, that they're at number nine is indicative of how deep the conference is this year. So we're going to learn a lot about them on Sunday when they play at Michigan. I have Rutgers at number eight. This might be a bit lower than some people have them. I still think this is a pretty solid Rutgers team. Uh, Syracuse nearly beat them in uh, Piscataway the other night, a subpar Syracuse team. So... At the sold-out rack. At the sold-out rack, exactly. So Rutgers is a team who could move up as well, but for now I have them at number eight. 
Indiana at number seven. This might be a team on the rise as well. They blew out both Providence and Stanford and Maui over thanks or the week after Thanksgiving, but Texas handled them and they nearly picked up a big win at Florida State last night. So I think this is a pretty solid Indiana team. I have Ohio State at number six. We don't know a ton about this Ohio State team yet because Seth Towns, their transfer forward from Harvard, has been injured, and I don't believe he's played yet this year. So that will be a big addition for them once they get him back. I have Michigan at number five. Uh, I could see moving them up as well. I almost put them in that number four spot, but if they win these next three in impressive fashion, like I think there's a realistic chance they do, then I'll continue moving them up this list. I have Wisconsin at number four. I almost flip-flopped them in Michigan. They lost at the buzzer at Marquette the other Friday night, but I still think this is a pretty darn solid Wisconsin team. Michigan State at number three. I almost put them at number two. They went into Duke and really handled Duke, although that win is not looking as impressive as it once did. I have Iowa at number two. They beat up North Carolina the other night in the Big Ten ACC Challenge. Granted, this isn't a typical North Carolina team, but uh, they still have a lot of talent, and this is a really good Iowa team. Illinois at number one, man. I've been most impressed with Illinois so far this year. They also went into Duke and really beat up on the Blue Devils, so that was impressive. Uh, Io DeSumo, Kofi Coburn, Adam Miller, and Andre Curbelo, the two freshmen. This team is loaded, and this is a potential Final Four team. It's going to be a grind playing this team this year, and uh, as of now, I think they're the best team in what is an absolutely loaded Big Ten Conference. Wow. Yeah, I like that. And by the way, Io has gotten even better from last year. You can just tell he's just smoother more polished and that is a dangerous thing because he's clutch uh, and he's just very very good in general um, and I like saying Georgie Bashanis Philly so I'll just say his name uh, he's also pretty good um, you you nailed the pronunciation Georgie, oh yeah Georgie Bashanis Philly he's six foot nine and even though he's that big he's a heck of a nice. dancer he yeah heck of a heck of a dancer yeah yeah apparently I don't know if it's ballet or what I think he's from Georgia I want to say, so I don't know, not, not of course, the U.S. state, but the European country. Atlanta? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I don't know if ballet's big out there, but, yeah, he's super light on his feet. Fun fact of the day. Wow. Okay, I like that. Um, yeah. He is, uh, yeah, I, I love saying that name. By the way, how did they let Kofi Coburn back in the Big Ten after he murdered that ref in the Michigan game last year? <laughs> seven foot 285 man how would you like that coming down on you like uh like he did last year that guy's a monster jamaican yeah i was surprised to see him come back for his sophomore year but i mean just the fact that uh that was a big point of contention if those of you that have been listening weekly or you just happened to catch the episode about a year ago today uh we were talking about i think we both agreed it should have been a technical even though it was an accident but you can't hit a ref over the head like that if it was Terry Weimer or Bo Borowski, it would have been fine in my book. Hey, then I would have liked those guys for that call. I thought, I mean, whatever. Let's get, I'll get to my uh, rankings here. Uh, I do have Illinois at, at one, Iowa at two. Uh, I actually think their defense looks a tad better than it did a year ago, and really the entire Fran McCaffrey. I don't know how he hasn't figured out. He's been coaching for so long how he has not figured out how to – uh, have a good defensive team, but it actually looks a tad better. It's good to see jo Jordan Bohannon back on the floor. Michigan State at three, um, just strength to schedule wise. You know, they're undefeated and they beat Duke. They did have the scare against Detroit Mercy. They beat Notre Dame by 10, even though they're winning that game by a lot more throughout the, the entirety of it. So Michigan State at three. Ohio State at four. They have the Notre Dame win. Haven't played anybody else really, but they've looked pretty good. Michigan at five. Hasn't played anybody uh, other than a couple MAC teams, as we talked about earlier, I actually have Rutgers higher than you at six. Uh, they haven't played anybody either. They almost lost to Syracuse, but uh, I think this team is going to be pretty solid again. And by the way, here's Wisconsin at seven. Probably a plot twist than most people thought. Uh, but if we're looking at power rankings, I think this team has a chance to shoot up the rankings for me. Um, but when you lose to Marquette like that, as a team that I thought was going to be, you know, a, a really high team in the Big Ten, which I still think they can be and will be. Um, but right now, Wisconsin, you're sitting in the middle of the pack here. Um, but again, if we do this in a week, they could be three, two, depending on who they play. Uh, Penn State at number eight. 
Uh, they had that impressive blowout win. Virginia Tech was ranked number 15. I don't put stock into early season uh, rankings, but if we're doing this right now and we're doing our own rankings, then I guess I have to a little bit. Uh, nine is Indiana. They've been kind of hot and cold. Blowout loss to Texas, lost to Florida State last night in overtime. I think that's a good Florida State team, though, so I'll, I'll give them the benefit of the down at, doubt at nine. Uh, Minnesota at 10. Maryland at 11. Purdue at 12. And, hey, I mean, Clemson. They might be, like, unreal. How good are they? But, um, you know, beating a couple Big Ten teams so far. Northwestern at 13. Frustrating loss last night. I wanted them to win by three or more uh, because I had a I had a, bet, a friendly uh, wager on that game. And then Nebraska. Uh, my only note on Nebraska is that they're Nebraska. And they're at 14. They're the bottom dweller in the Big Ten right now. What do you think? I like it. I think your rankings are pretty darn good. Obviously, we differed in a few uh, picks, but... Honestly, we're splitting hairs at this point. We're, what, five games in, so we, there's so much we don't know about these teams. The main thing that jumped out at me was having Wisconsin at number seven, and I was super high on Wisconsin coming in, and I still am, but I kind of like having them at seven because when you look at the full body of work and what other teams have done, I have no problem having them in the middle of the pack when considering they did lose to a Marquette team who I don't think is considered to be great, so... Yeah, I like it, mixing it up a little bit. I like how high you have Michigan. I think as a whole, your picks are pretty darn good. Uh, using the term full body of work, what are you, a college football playoff committee member or something? <laughs> Don't even get me started on those guys. Uh, a bunch of old, older people who have never played the game, and I don't think they know what to look for. So comparing someone to a college football committee member is a huge insult in my book. Hey. No ageism here. It doesn't matter their age. But, yeah, I, I don't think that it's the right system here. But that's neither here nor there. Um, very quickly, college football picks. And then I got one over under for you to finish us off. Um, looking at this slate here, there's not a ton of great games. I'll go North Carolina at Miami. Miami minus three at home. Number 10 versus number 17. I got went Miami winning by more than three. That spread is way too close. In my opinion, North Carolina started off the year hot. They rose to as high as number five at one point in the rankings. Uh, Sam Howell, at quarterback, they're outstanding sophomore. Uh, but really, I don't think that that they're going to go into Miami and win. Miami's eight and one on the year. They've only dropped one game so far. This is a pretty darn good Miami team. Manny Diaz has these guys heading in the right direction. So give me Miami by 10 or so. Yeah, I agree with you. I think North Carolina is super overrated, uh, especially coming into the year. I think at what, like number four or five or something yeah, like that? Yeah, way Ridiculous. too high. It's a cute little story what Mac Brown has done there in Chapel Hill in a second go around, but this is not a top 10 or top 15 team or anything like that. Yeah, every, everyone wanted to anoint him before this season, uh, and they kind of wanted, they were like pushing for it to happen, um, <laughs> for him yeah. to just be that good and have that turnaround but it's just not it just hasn't, hasn't happened that quick it's not not that easy right and, um, and let's not forget this is not the mac brown of old and it's important to remember how uh how far texas dropped in his final years out there true um wisconsin at iowa iowa is a one point dog at home against two and two wisconsin but a, a pretty good wisconsin team uh iowa it's hard to know what to make of them um, Iowa at home. I'll take them to win. You know what, Clay Dog? I'm going to disagree with you on one thing you said. Uh, is this a pretty darn good Iowa t or Wisconsin team? I'm starting to reconsider after the yeah. one. After I, the I think they're solid. I mean, they've done some good. They have. They have. Although, I mean, they've played four games. How are we supposed to know, you know? I think you have to look at the, the big picture and consider Indiana. Held them to what was it, six or 12 points at Camp Randall last Saturday in Northwestern? Held them true. to. True, Indiana's good though. But true, without Michael Penix though. Well, right, but that was their defense. True. Them. And then, then <laughs> Northwestern beat them by, I think it was 10. So I've got Iowa winning this one. Kinnick's a tough place to play. Iowa's five and two. They've won five in a row after their 0 and 2 start. And I'm actually a little surprised Wisconsin's favored, Graham Mertz has really tailed off since that hot start to the year when he tore up Illinois and Michigan. So give me Iowa, and uh, this is always a fun matchup every year. Two old-school, grinded-out teams, but I've got Iowa pulling out this one by seven points or so. 
Okay. And those are the only two games we'll pick because I, I just hate the rest of the matchups. And it's depressing to look at this college football slate and see Michigan, Ohio State canceled. Purdue, Indiana canceled too. Um, over-unders. Last thing, Hunter Dickinson, three and a half Big Ten Freshman of the Week awards. He won the one last week. Uh, he looks like he's just going to keep racking them up. Um, also, I would like to switch my preseason uh, Big Ten Freshman of the Year pick to Hunter Dickinson. Is that allowed to do five games in? No, absolutely not. Okay. Well, I'm taking the over on the three and a half Big Ten Freshman of the Week awards. What do you got? You know what, Clay, man, you and I agree once again. I'm taking the over as well. He might just be the best freshman in this conference. If you're switching your uh, preseason Big Ten Freshman of the Year pick, I'm switching mine as well because my Chris. Yeah. My Christian Lander pick was atrocious. He's hardly even playing for Indiana so far this year at point guard. So Adam Miller for Illinois obviously comes to mind as for the other good freshman. That was my pick. Yeah. Yep, I remember that. Doing well. And, and that's still a good pick, sure. Andre Curbelo for Illinois, I think, also has to be thrown into that mix. But, man, who are the other really, really good freshmen in the conference off the top of my head? None are coming to mind. So, yeah, Dickinson probably is the best freshman in the league at this point. Yeah, so we're both on the over there. Franz Wagner, by the way, had three last year. so And he really came on towards the end of the year and obviously was hurt to, to start the season. So I think it's very realistic Hunter could get uh, more than three. Uh, but uh, that is our show for this week. Uh, some basketball talk. I bet some people skip through the football stuff, but that's all right. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed the basketball talk here as we go forward. We'll continue it. Uh, use the promo code BLUE60 at thewolverine.com for 60 days for free. And we'll talk to you next week.